She said, oh, I must visit you there. It's colder. <laughs> Which is very much, very much true. So as you know, Geyer is the grandson of Ashburn Furling. He lives with his wife and his two children in Tromsø, northern Norway, where he works at the Tromsø University Hospital as an anesthesiologist. I had the distinct pleasure of hearing him reflect on his grandfather and his discovery of PKU at the last European uh, PKU Society meeting, and I knew that I just had to bring him here to make sure that all of us understand and can celebrate the history of this disease that affects all of us in this room. So please join me in welcoming Geyer. I'm assuming they'll bring up your slides. Uh, they won't. There we go. They're right here. Oh, excellent. Do you want me to take this back? You're no, right. I'll, I'll need this. Okay. Christine, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, a, uh, an honor to be here. My qualifications for being here are that I am one out of six grandchildren of Osbjorn Furlings. I too am a physician, and that background gives me, makes it a little easier for me to understand the biochemistry of this disease. I will try to take us back some hundred years in time, and I realize that I will be using language and words at that time Sorry? Could you please stand by the microphone? I have a, uh, a portable microphone. But if, if it makes a difference, I will. And uh, what is today termed as an intellectual disability, you all know that during the first days of life, all newborn babies are tested for rare congenital diseases. If one of these is found, treatment can begin immediately and we will avoid damage that can otherwise render the patient crippled. The first such disease was discovered by my grandfather and in Norway it still bears his name, Fölling's Sykdom, whereas in the rest of the world it's called phenylketonuria or PKU for short. On average, the incidence of this condition is one out of 15,000 newborn babies, but with great, con uh, great geographical variability. In Norway, about 60,000 births per year, there are four or five new cases. In the US, there is more than four million new babies every year. That means 200 to more than 300 new babies every year are born with this condition. Apart from the obvious mental retardation, these patients are agitated and restless all the time. They have muscular stiffness. Many of them have epileptic seizures. Some lack the ability to walk or talk, and all have light skin, often with eczema. And they all have a peculiar odor to their urine. Untreated, PKU is devastating to the families affected and a great economic burden to them as well as to society. But if treated, all of this can be avoided. There are excellent reviews of this disease. It's genetics, biochemistry, and treatment on the web. But as his grandson, I will try to give a slightly more personal presentation of the discovery of this disease and the man behind it. Grandfather was already retired when I came into the picture in 1960. Here I'm held by my grandmother, Guri, ready for my questioning. And here in the lap of greatness, on the bench, at our summer house, 
which grandfather purchased after he retired to spend the summers where he would love to grow flowers and work the soil, perhaps returning to his roots. His roots were the Ferling farm in the county of Trøndelag, the middle of Norway, where the summers are short and cold and the winters are long and cold. <laughs> his, one of his earliest childhood memories is from carrying a handful of an armful of logs for the kitchen stove because it was his chore to keep firewood for the kitchen stove. His mother would stop him and tell him, today you are five years old, boy. That's all that was made out of a child's birthday those days. The children were considered part of the workforce that was needed to make things work on a large farm. This incident happened about 125 years ago as he was born August 30. 23rd, 1888. Because he was the youngest out of seven siblings, it was his job to be a shepherd all summer. He would also have to help with harvest. Perhaps that is why he liked the winters the most, because then the children were allowed to go to school every second day. Children of all ages met in a single classroom. He cherished his schoolmaster and he was very fond of reading. It is said that at the end of the school, he had read all the books in the school. So he was allowed to go to high school, which was unusual for a, for a farmer boy in those days. And the high school was located in Trondheim, a large city about two hours away. And this was only made possible because his older sister was married and lived in Trondheim so he could stay with her. Being a farm boy turned academic could prove socially challenging. One time when he caught a ride home after a semester in Trondheim, the farmer who gave him a ride asked him, well, what are you working with? And grandfather replied, well, I go to school, I study. Oh, I can see that, the farmer replied. I can see that from your clean hands that you're not working. There were other challenges. While at school, he fell ill with tuberculosis, and the doctor told him, go home and cure for one year. You're welcome back next year if you're still alive. He was, and he finished uh, school in good health. One year before, the, there was a new school in Trondheim, a technical college. He wanted to pursue studies. His family was somewhat skeptic, but allowed him to go to school. And in 1916, he graduated with a chemistry major. When he told his family that now he wanted to study medicine, they thought him perhaps a bit eccentric. But with the help of his brother, he had one brother, who offered to run both farms that were part of the estate, his father allowed this. He even offered to sell an ox to help with the economy. Osbjorn did not want any of that. He moved to Oslo and made his living by tutoring other medical students. And he also worked as an assistant at the Department of Physiology, where he started to do research on muscle oxygen and its metabolism. He graduated his medical studies when he was 34 years old. I know this is a bit many portrait photographs, but one photograph every five years, that was about the norm at that time, so I hope it can pass. But every summer he had to come home and help with the, the, the harvest. That nearly cost him his life one year because he was traveling home on a self-constructed bike and he took, of course, the shortest route, which was following the railroad tracks right into the tunnel when the train came. Fortunately, there was a niche in the wall, and he, he came away uh, from it all unscathed. In 1926, he received a university grant and later a Rockefeller Fellowship, and this enabled him to work in a larger setting these photographs from his passport shows 
that he made several trips to the US where he spent time at Harvard, at John Hopkins, at Yale, and he even made a trip to the Mayo Clinic. These were very exciting times in medicine. This was the time when the reason for diabetes was uh, determined and insulin was uh, made for the first time. During his time in the US, he continued his studies on metabolism, and he was invited on an expedition by Professor Hasselbalk to study oxygen consumption in working muscle at high altitudes. This is a photograph from a provisionary lab in the Rocky Mountains at 10,000 feet. But they wanted to go still higher. They wanted to go to the top, to 16,000 feet. The mules were not able to carry the, their equipment, so they had to carry it on their own backs. And if that was not enough, it didn't make matters any easier when their tent was blown away during a storm. But they were able to keep their equipment, to get the results, and to find new discoveries that were published and still are part of the backbone of today's knowledge of high altitude physiology. During the time at the Mayo Clinic, he laid the foundation for his doctoral thesis on the mechanism of ammonium chloride acidosis. In that, he demonstrated the kidney's ability to rid the body of excess acid. And as a true scientist, according to the day, he used himself as a guinea pig. And he would write, I had difficulty breathing, nausea, and skin itching on ingestion of ammonium chloride. When he later looked back at his scientific achievements, he regarded this as his highest contribution. And he would say with tongue in cheek that this was probably one of the best theses ever written because it was so delightfully short. <laughs> he was employed at the state hospital where the patients were tended to by Red Cross nurses in starched aprons and hats. Grandfather, too, wanted to work with patients, with people behind the diagnosis, like he would see his fellow colleagues do. But instead, because of his chemistry background, he was assigned to set up the lab that was to serve the medical wards. There probably, with a lot of work and studies, there was not much time for courtship and partying. But eventually, he got attached to a much younger uh, nurse, nursing student, Guri Opsal. And it is said that after a ball, he sent her a large bouquet of red roses. That was most unusual behavior for him, not his style at all. And the next summer, she followed him to the furling farm was very well received by the family, and they married the next year. They settled in Oslo, and for the following 40 years or so, they rented this apartment in Oskarsgata 80. One year after they were married, they had their first child, a daughter, and he, here, grandfather is on the balcony with her, my mother, reading the newspaper and smoking his cigar. I looked further into the family album and saw that they would often visit the mountains, especially during the summertime. And in the caption below this photo, it says, this is where Ragna, my mother, took her first steps. Um, Osbjorn's clinical lab was on the attic floor in this building at the National Hospital. He was known as a skillful lab technician. And one day when a patient came in in diabetic coma, the Professor Holst would say, send for Fullingham, have him ma make insulin. Of course, one cannot make insulin in a rudimentary lab. But Professor Holt had seen uh, the potential in my grandfather. And he had a professorate of clinical nutrition established for him in 1932. He was working there, 
when one morning he was approached by a despondent young mother, Mrs. Borgny Egelang. She had two children. They were perfectly normal at birth, a boy and a girl. But shortly, they started to fall behind, progressing to severe mental retardation. And in addition, there was a peculiar odor that clung to their urine. This is that odor. I would like to pass it around, but because of the seating arrangement, I will leave it up here for now and invite you to come and smell it yourself afterwards. The children's father, Harry, he was a dentist, and he was afflicted with asthma, and he felt that his asthmatic attacks got worse when he was around the children, and especially because of their odor. They had been to numerous doctors already, but no one could explain the children's condition. And their boy had even been admitted to the hospital for one, uh, for one week at the National Hospital. I would like Borgny Egeland to explain this to us in her own words. Og alt fungerte sånn som det skulle, og alt var strålende. Men så viste det seg at hun ikke ville begynne å gå, ikke før hun var 14-16 måneder. Men når hun først startet og begynte å gå, så var det en snikk til å stoppe. Men så fikk hun ikke til å snakke, men da hun var to år, så begynte hun å vente at nå får hun begynne. Nå skal det komme, men det ble bare noen få ord og så videre. Så begynte vår gang til leger for å høre hva det kunne komme. Og de bare trøstet oss og sa at det retter seg nok, hun er så sprek. Så det blir nok all right. Vi var så unge og glade. Det var på våre fødder. Vi var bare mærket. And we felt the world opening up to us, even better when our daughter was born and everything worked the way it should and all was good. But then it turned out she could not walk, not until she was about 16 months. But once she started walking, there was no stopping her. But then she could not learn to talk. When she was two, we thought, now she's about to start talking. But there were only a few words. Then we started seeing different doctors to find out what was going on but they only comforted us and told us things will work out all right. She's in good health, so it will be all right. Grandfather had destined himself to a career of lab medicine at that time. He did not have any clinical practice, nor did he see patients. But he would not turn down anybody who came to him and asked for help. So when Borgne Egeland came, he said he would, of course, examine her children, and perhaps he could find the reason for this strange smell. He examined the children, and apart from the obvious mental retardation, he found constant restlessness, fair skin, eczema. There would be no clinical exam complete without a urinalysis, and he thought possibly because of this smell they might have an infection of some sort. So he made the usual test of Gerhardt's reaction, which is used to check for ketoacidosis in diabetic patients. If we could have lights off, The historical action was to drip a few drops of iron chloride in the acidified urine, and in normal urine, nothing will happen. But a deep Bordeaux or mahogany color will develop in diabetic patients with ketonuria or after ingesting salicylates and a few other drugs. Instead, 
he observed a deep green-bluish reaction. He had never seen this before. So he thought perhaps there could be a contamination in the tube. He repeated the test and he got the same reaction with the green color. There was another peculiarity. Left to stand, the green color would start to fade and was almost gone within 15 minutes. He thought perhaps there was a unknown substance causing this, and he determined to try and find it. He asked Mrs. Eglon to come back with new samples. Once the kids had been off diet, uh, they had several herbal supplements and medications that they were taking at the time. She did, and this time the reaction was even stronger. Later, she came back with a total of 40 pints of urine. That was a tremendous accomplishment, especially considering that her children were not able to cooperate in the process. He saturated the urine with sodium chloride. He acidified it, and then he extracted this unknown compound in ether. But after several, and he would always know where the compound was because of this green reaction. But after several cycles, it faded and he was left with a black spot in the bottom of the test tube. So he thought perhaps the substance would oxidize in normal room air. So we did everything over, now under a nitrogen atmosphere, and the green uh, color remained. And after four weeks, he was able to, uh, to purify a white powder with a constant melting point of 155 degrees centigrade, which is a probable sign of purity. He mixed this with, uh, he oxidized this compound and he distilled it and he would describe the immense joy in the lab when they noticed the needle-like crystals of benzoic acid develop on the inside of the uh, oxidation column. Because this compound uh, was oxidized to benzoic acid and oxalic acid, after another few weeks, he had identified a benzene ring with a three carbon chain. And he was trying to think, what could this possibly be? Could it be phenyl pyruvate? So we mixed it with his crystals from the urine with phenyl pyruvate from a known source, again tested the melting point, and it remained exactly 155 degrees centigrade, which was a, a certain sign of purity. So now he had identified the compound. He published his finding in the German paper Hoppe Seiler's Zeitschrift in 1934. This is one of the few remaining uh, reprints of that, and I'd be happy to show that to you as well. But it did not receive much attention. Here is my uncle studying it after we located it in the attic, and it reads. We have found a metabolic disorder in these children that displays itself by excreting phenylpyruvate in their urine. And since I have never found phenylpyruvate in the urine of any other person, and it has not been described elsewhere, it is probable there is a connection between the metabolic dis disorder and the mental retardation. But what exactly what the was it that spurred him on to continue his research? In his paper, he only writes, the urine assumes a transient deep green color following the addition of iron chloride. This appearance prompted me to further analysis. I believe it was a combination of his own personality and his chemistry background that made the difference between what could easily have been a spurious uh, finding and what turned out to be a novel scientific discovery. At this time, he was working alone and without any grants. In particular, it could have, with his background of 
urine analysis from his own thesis, he was an expert at understanding the significance of any color change in a chemical reaction. But I think there was more. It was Mrs. Borgny Egelan. He must have pitied her family, and he must have valued her persistence. And he had many reasons to identify with her family, himself having a three-year healthy girl at home who was later to become my mother. Here she is with him during summer vacation in the mountains. And here they are in the backyard at their uh, city apartment. He, him being a 42-year-old first-time father probably would not roll around on the floor so much with his kids, but he would take them on his lap and he would read to them fairy tales. He would read about the wolf and the three little pigs and some of the f tales he had even written himself. He did not have call and he did not work in the weekends, so we, he would always come home punctually from work and spend some time with the children. The next year, the School of Veterinary Medicine was completed and opened, and he was called to his next professorate there. He spent 20 of his happiest working years at the School of Veterinary Medicine. He loved the atmosphere of medicine, biochemistry, and agriculture, and maybe most of all, teaching students. And in the serene environment of these buildings, he was able to continue his research. Because there were so many more questions to be answered, the first of call, could there be any other mentally retarded children who excreted phenylpurivate in their urine? To try and find out, he visited all the institutions for the mentally retarded in the Oslo area that spring, and eventually he had samples from 430 patients. In addition to the Egeland uh, children, he now had 11 patients. At this time, even 30 years later, care for the menti mentally handicapped had not come any further than what I will show you in the following movie in my country. This boy does not appear in any statistic. He is among those who are not accounted for, one of the 50% who do not receive public support. He lives in a room with bare walls. Because he breaks everything, he refuses to wear shoes, so at least his toes have some freedom. We cannot scandalize at his family. His family deals with the problem fate has handed them as best as it can. It is an achievement in and of itself by a mother and father to look matters straight in the eye, accept the situation, ask for help, queue up for support, and make decisions. That is a challenge even in a caring community. It can all be impossible in communities that, that do not offer support. Then the only way out can be to put the child away, behind that wall of social prejudice and personal shame that present-day society creates. We cannot expect people to come and beg for assistance and advice, expect them to spontaneously make correct applications on the right form in the correct number of copies. Society has to seek out and reach out to those who need help, provide information, and extend services so that they reach everyone, not just every second. It is we who create the environment. It is in our faces that makes a child a prisoner in his own destiny. It shouldn't be so that developmentally delayed children in the middle of our city cannot come out of pl to play because mothers call in their healthy children go in circles around the outcast and create a pressure that neither parents nor siblings can stand up against. To isolate a developmentally delayed child is to stop watering a thirsting plant. Community support and equality is a condition for any successful upbringing, 
And so these children need, even more than their peers, to be included among the many. Among my grandfather's first patients were four pairs of siblings and three of their parents were fairly close relatives, leading him to think that could there possibly be an inherited component in this disease? But he would need more patients. So he teamed up with a genetics professor, Moor, and a medical student who was on sabbatical for a year and traveled all around our country to find people in institutions or at home and get urine samples from them. Mr. Rood was even arrested by the police trying to obtain a sample from a mentally retarded boy. But he had with him a letter from uh, the health um, ministry, so he was released. And finally, they had 40 positive patients, just enough to determine a autosomal recessive inheritance pattern, meaning that if both parents are healthy but carriers of the disease gene, on average, one-fourth of their children would be afflicted. This was a very rare disease in the general population, but it was not so rare in institutions for the mentally handicapped, where about one out of 40 had this condition. During this time, Europe was waging a war, and after a while, my country was engulfed with it, in it. My mother and uncle were evacuated part of the time, especially during the summer when they could be sent to the mountains, when they could sleep soundly without being waked up by sirens and explosions in the middle of the night. And they would get fresh milk from cows on summer pasture. Grandfather would try to make it there as often as he could, and every time when he appeared on the horizon, they would think that the war had stopped. But it took many years for that to happen. During the war, Osbjorn had to go to a funeral at the Furling farm, and my mother followed him. And she would recall that during their train travel, his mood would get better all the time, and at Dover Station, he would go into a complete transformation where he would start to talk his regional accent. That was very, very different from the polished Oslo accent that he was normally speaking. He had turned the farmer once again. The next question, scientifically, was to try and determine what is the metabolic disturbance causing there to be phenylpyruvate in the urine? There must have been some guesswork involved. Because of its similar molecular structure, phenylalanine was a likely suspect, though. Normally, phenylalanine would be hydroxylated to tyrosine, which is a precursor of other important molecules like dopamine, noradrenaline, and melanin. Grandfather thought perhaps the patients lacked the ability to make this conversion, and instead they would have an excess phenylalanine that then needed to be metabolized to other things, for instance, phenylpyruvate by deamination. Normal persons can metabolize large quantities of phenylalanine, patients none. Maybe carriers, genetic carriers, would be somewhere in between. He set out to load potential carriers with phenylalanine, and true to his science, he started with himself. He was probably not too happy when he discovered that his urine turned green with this, phenyl, uh, this uh, iron chloride reaction. So he asked a friend for permission, and his urine turned green as well. Then he thought, maybe it is the racemic mixture of L and D phenylalanine that is available to me that causes this. Uh, normal biological mo molecules will um, exist in mirror images of one another, but the body can only handle the L, uh, the L uh, isomer of it. So 
he had to order the purified L phenyl alanine from the U.S. He had to pay out of pocket for this. It is said that he dipped into our fam family savings and he had to wait for a long time, more than a year during the war. But finally, the compound arrived. He tested himself and his friend again. The urine reaction did not turn green, so he was now on the right track. Next they would need a bioassay to determine the level of phenylalanine in the blood. The urine was not accurate enough. And by pure serendipity, they found that a very common bacteria was able to make this deamination from phenylalanine to phenylpurivate. So they would take serum from patients, carriers, and healthy people, and they, after a while, they would be able to determine that after the ingestion of a certain amount of l phenylalanine, they would be able to identify carriers. This was very important because it would m answer the question of possible genetic counseling with a resounding yes. After the war, this is the family gathered in the uh, um, Easter of 1946. One fellow professor has told an anecdote that very accurately, I think, describes grandfather. They were on their way to a scientific meeting in Boston. And in the same car are a number of other people going to the same meeting. And one of the men very enthusiastically explains about this discovery that he has read about, this great discovery of phenylketonuria. And after a while, it becomes apparent that my grandfather is going to the same meeting. And when the first passenger learns that he too is from Norway, he asks him, well, maybe you have heard of Professor Ferling's work. And my grandfather looks to the floor bashfully and he says, I am Ferling. Grandfather was deeply involved in the first attempts at making a diet. Because the thinking was that since these patients could not metabolize the, this particular amino acids, maybe we can find a diet that has just the bare necessity of it. But the first attempts tasted horrible. It was tedious to make, it was a burden on the family, and of course the children, it was very hard uh, for them to, to eat it. And unfortunately, they found that brain damage was irreversible often after only a few weeks. However, it did make some of the other symptoms go away. The patients would have fewer seizures and they would be less restless. Horst Pickel was the first person who created a workable diet and my grandfather was very happy to see it work on his first patients. Until newborn screening was commonplace, the first patient in every family would have to be sacrificed, so to say, speak to the disease before it was possible to screen any subsequent babies and treat them from birth. Newborn screening was initiated in the 60s here in the US uh, because of Dr. Robert Guthrie. Robert Guthrie also developed the special blotting paper that makes it possible to take blood samples and store them and send them off to a faraway lab. It was initially very difficult to get support for this and initially he got a plain refusal. But now there are 40 possible uh, tests uh, available. Most and many uh, developed countries have more than 20 of them in use. Most important still are PKU, and then galactosemia and hypothyroidism. Reluctantly, grandfather left the School of Veterinary Medicine after 20 years when he was called to his next professorate at the, at the National Hospital. He was called there to set up a new lab for clinical chemistry. When he retired in 1958, though, he went back to the School of Veterinary Medicine. 
to spend his retirement years. Eventually, his work became internationally acknowledged, and in 1962, he was among the first six recipients of the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Award for work on mentally retarded children during a ceremony at the White House. I should show you, though, that probably his expectations, he may not have understood the significance of the event because he showed up in his everyday gray wool suit. The Kennedy Foundation gave him this beautiful crystal piece with the great seraph Raphael engraved on it, patron of science and healing, which is still adorns the mantelpiece in my mother's home. He also received other prizes internationally from Norway and abroad. But it is said that what touched him the most was a telegram from his Borgny Egelon, without whom his science would never have been placed on this track. This is the way he worded it when he received the Anders Jare Prize in 1960. If you could play that, please. Vi er alle redskaper. Jeg ble et av redskapene til oppdagelsen og klarleggelsen av den sykdom som vi her tar om. Det gikk nemlig naturligvis ikke slik for seg at jeg en vakker dag bestemte meg for å finne noe nytt. Tvert imot, problemet kom til meg og krevde sin løsning. En mor med to åndssvake barn kom med det svake håp at jeg kanskje kunne hjelpe henne. Hun var det som satte det hele i gang, og henne tilkommer den første takk. We are all instruments. I was one of the instruments for discovering and understanding the disease we are talking about. Of course, it did not happen that I just one morning woke up and decided to find a new disease. Quite to the contrary, the problem came to me and demanded its solution. A mother with two retarded children came with a small hope that perhaps I could help her. She was the one who started it, and the first gratitude goes to her. In his retirement years, he would still write teach and think. He felt his abilities and strength diminish, though, and thought his mission fulfilled. Here he is in his office viewing the famous poster of Cammy and Sheila McGrath, cover girls for the 1961 National Association for Retarded Children in the U.S. For grandfather, the greatness in little things was as important as greatness in big things, and he would take little retarded children on his lap as on in wearing his gray suit as easily as he would meet the president in the White House. Sometimes he would receive gifts. This ceramic plaque from one boy in one institution, he held very highly, and it adorned the wall in my grandparents' home, now in mine, and we cherish, cherish this as much as any Van Gogh or Picasso. Of course, we don't have any of those. <laughs> Grandfather would be a frequent guest in our home, and we take, he would take my sister and me on his lap, and nobody could impersonate monsters and fairy princesses better than him. He would also take me around in his garden at his summer house where he would grow berries, strawberries, and raspberries, and let me have a taste. One summer, Grandma and Grandpa were taking care of me while my parents were working in the city. 
he said he, people often would come to him for advice, but he would say one should never give advice without being asked. I must have been the exception, though, because I was very proud that I had learned to swim, and I would swim the 150 yards across the uh, pool where our summer house was. And when I came back, he would give me a piece of advice that I will never forget. <laughs> My friend who had swam with me, though, she got $5 from her father. He was probably very, very scared having to take care of me. He had a good sense of humor, but it was deeply buried. He would leave his marks also by writing poems. This one is penned into the visitor book in our cabin. It's called Ascent. And the poem itself describes climbing a mountain, but the underlying message is the war-stricken country's ability to climb its way out of war, the terrors of war, and into new peace. He had his feet firmly planted on the ground. When I was little, I wished for my birthday a big yellow excavator or maybe a rocket. He wanted me to have something of purpose, so he gave me this sawhorse. <laughs> and I think unlike any yellow excavator or rocket, this sawhorse has been with me my entire life and has been of use all the time, even today. In many ways, he was a visionary. He would see possibilities in education, but he would also see the woes of the future. He would worry about exploitation of the soil and overpopulation. He wrote about pollution and a shortage of scarce resources like phosphorus. And he was concerned about our decreasing ability to give up privileges and comfort. I think he felt very much responsibility for our world. I was only 12 years old when he suffered a stroke that tied him to the wheelchair and made it very difficult for him to speak. He died in 1973 at the age of 84. He was thankful for the possibility of having been a physician and a scientist, a tool in the hands of the creator. He appreciated life, but without fear of death. And when my mother asked him on his deathbed if he was afraid of dying, he would just answer, no, but I think it will be a great change. <laughs> Some 85 years later, we can look back and acknowledge that good science can be performed by a single individual with limited resources and even without grants or subsidies. Some advances are tremendously costly and take big team efforts. Other discoveries just stand there right in front of us, waiting for us to stumble over them. It only requires of us to keep our eyes open as we stumble. Thank you.